Let's try this one more time. I try to be ready. I was just running late today. Well, good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord again. Yeah. Have all my notes. Brother Eli, do you mind collecting the Sunday school offering, please? Chapter 
16 and 1 and 56 and uh, Psalm 6, 56, 7, 8, 9, 60. It's just referring to them as golden psalms. Now today we're going to look at the word Muthlaven, and we're going to find that in Psalm chapter 9. And if you'd like to turn there, because we're actually going to be looking at Psalm chapter 8 today. So Psalm chapter 9, and right in the heading, it states, To the chief musician upon Muthlaven, to die for the son, a psalm of David. So Muthlaven, or Muthlaven. We find it occurs in Psalm chapter 9, verse 1, right there in the heading. And it actually can be broken apart. The Hebrew word there for the first part, M-U-T-H, is actually uh, M-U-W-T-H in the Hebrew. Muth. I know those weren't the, but that's the closest we can get to ours. And according to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it means... Uh, to die for the sun. It was probably the title of a popular song, Death. So when we look at this word and study it out, at this point, according to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it points to the fact that it was the title to a song. And let's keep in mind when we look at titles of poems in the during this time frame, when we think of a title, the pastor gets up, he might give us a title for the message that he's given. And the title goes right along with the message, and the whole point of a title in our culture is so you remember what is being discussed. But when we go back to this time frame, they could have added titles to their poems that had nothing to do with the poem. So the poem could be absolutely about grief, and it could be the summer, the lamb in the summertime, and it could be something completely different. But when we look at this word, Muthlaven, it actually states uh, to die for the sun, according to Hebrews, uh, Strong's Hebrew Dictionary. When we look at the Hebrew word, it only occurs two times in the entire Old Testament. In Psalm chapter 9, 1, in Psalm 48, and verse 14. And there you're not going to find it in the heading of the title, like we did in uh, the heading of the psalm like we did in Psalm chapter 9, but rather the word month is going to be in the verse itself because verse 14 of chapter 48 states, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. And the Hebrew word for death there was month. It has been mostly agreed upon that this is the title of the psalm. So, like I said before, sometimes these words are referring to the instrument, other times are referring to the title of the psalm itself. But many agree that the word Muthlaven actually refers to the title of this psalm. And some believe that it could be translated death to the son. It is also believed that it was written on the death of David. It is also believed that it is a song remembering the victory that David had over Absalom that was brought on by Absalom's death. And some believe it was composed to commemorate David's, David's victory over the Philistines. According to Barnes' notes on the Old Testament, he said, For him who unites this song with the following supposes that the whole people, uh, that the whole refers to the time of the captivity in Babylon and a triumphal song of the people over their enemies, and Benima, who also thinks that these two psalms should be united, suppose that Psalms 9, 1 through 18 refers to David and to his deliverance from all his enemies and the remainder to the times of the Maccabees, and the deliverance from the persecutions under Antiochus Epiphanes. Then according to Barnes notes as well, he states that the Targum, or the Aramaic paraphrase, the writing there renders it to be sung over the man that went out between the camps. And that is referring to Goliath and Gath. And the author of the Aramaic paraphrase evidently supposed it was written on the occasion of his death, referring to David's death. So when we look at the word Muthlaven, it points to more of a title than actually an instrument that's used to be played during this song itself. 
and everyone that I've read agrees that this is the title of the song. Now we have to keep in mind one thing. If David is truly the author of this song, then it could not have been to, in reference to refer to the Babylonian captivity, and it could not have referred to that being there, because now I know I'm going to get pulling, um, reaching out there a little bit more, but do you remember what the Maccabean era was? Do you remember when the Apocrypha was written? And this is just trying to give us timelines and time frames. The Apocrypha, which contains the book of First and Second Maccabees, which while that book we do not adhere to as the Holy Scripture, because there are errors in it, there are things in there that um, are completely unbiblical to begin with, but we can take the book of First and Second Maccabees as a history book. It would be no different as if you went out and bought a history book of the United States. So we're not taking it as the Word of God, but as a history book. The Apocrypha itself, which contains the book of First and Second Maccabees, was written between the last book of the Old Testament and the first book of the New Testament. So the Apocrypha falls in between the timeline of the ending of Malachi and the Gospels, those 500 years of silence. And also, when we talk about the Babylonian captivity, did that occur before David's birth or after David's birth? When did the Babylonians take over Israel and Jerusalem? Was that before David or after David? Point out about this song. 
And don't be afraid to pick the tiniest detail because if we're going to study something, at least if I'm going to spend my time truly studying something, Brother Eli, I am going to pick that thing apart with a fine tooth comb as much time as I have to do it. So what's one of the first things we see about Psalm chapter 8? What are some things we might want to know about Psalm chapter 8? If somebody wrote something and you really, really enjoyed it and you really wanted to get a copy of it, what's one of the first things you're going to probably do? Look for it. You're going to look for it, but how are you going to look for it? What are some things that might come to mind that you might be inquisitive about? Nowadays, on the computer, or you might go to a bookstore. Yeah, but how might they start looking for it? <laughs> the title. The title, which we have somebody added to it, so we want the title. And what is the title there, brother? What do, what do they have in your Bible? Or you want me to just go ahead and read it? Well, I know the same thing it says here. It all the pay that need to. Yep. Oh, yeah, the cross reference, brother. Yeah, yeah. We're, we'll get there later. Yeah, I mean, no, no. Yeah, you're, you're, uh, you're ahead of me, brother. We're not quite there yet. We'll talk about that later. Trust me, I am touching on that later. But one of the first things we might want to do is, like you said, brother, you're going to look for the title, which some Bibles might be a little bit different, but this was at, at a later date. To the chief, chief no, I'm in chapter six, so moving to eight. To the chief musician upon Gittit, which is a Gittite heart, or a heart from Gath, we talked about this in one of our words, a psalm of David. So we have the title. If you have the title of something, then what do you look for next? And maybe the person that wrote it. Exactly, brother. Who wrote it? So we're going to try and find out if we know who wrote it. So who wrote Psalm chapter 8, according to the title that's been added to our Bibles? David wrote um, Psalm chapter 8. And we know that we, he was given instruction, or he gave instruction, how and what instruments it is to be played. And it's a harp from Gath. Now, I want to pause here and go on a side note, because I thought this was interesting, and I didn't think about this until I was studying last night. Um, we were talking about with the Gittite heart when we were talking about the Gittit in our key words. And when David might come across it, we talked about how it might have been there when he was fleeing for his life from King Saul. But David also made another trip to Gath that I didn't realize that when he went back to get the ark. Because the ark in the house of Obadidim, Obadidim resided in the area of Gath. So maybe Obadidim was using the heart, the Gittite, or Gittith around the um, Ark of the Covenant. Maybe he had it in his house. Maybe he introduced David to that as well for worship. So that's always a possibility. But regardless, we know that this song was instructed that it should be played upon a heart from Gath, the Gittith. Now, some other things we might want to know is, well, how many verses does it contain? And we know from looking down at our Bible real quick that there are eight verses that this psalm has been designed, divided into. Now, as we continue on studying a chapter, there are some other things we want to find out. What do you think are some key words or a key word in this psalm itself? As we look at Psalm chapter 8, what are some of the what are some words that would probably describe this psalm in a nutshell? Something they see maybe happen over and over, but just something that would help describe this passage to a T. Perhaps you look down and you see um, in verse um, 1 and 9 specifically, uh, verse 9. Out of eight verses, verse nine, but I think it's verse eight. There is nine verses. There are nine verses. Yes. I messed up the numbers. 
There are nine verses in Psalm chapter 8. That's probably where I got the eight. So nine verses. And if we would look at some key words in verse 9 and 1 specifically, it would probably be excellent. Because when God is looking over this, he's talking about his creation. Uh, and we're, and they're, I shouldn't say God, but the David's talking about the creation of, that God created. He's talking about God himself and how his majesty and sovereign and everything he looks down is excellent. And probably the other one I would throw in there is man as well, because he's also talking about man. When we look at it, we see the first Adam being mentioned, because he had dominion over the fish of the sea and the air, we would assume. And all power was given him at that time. And if we had to come up with a key verse that would just sum up this whole passage in a nutshell, what do you think would be the key verse? What's that? I said nine. Nine? I don't know. I think nine would be fine. I put verse one. But nine basically repeats verse one, so it's fine too. Because it's all talking about how excellent is the Lord. And if we were to, and when we look at the psalm in general, it discusses three specific things. God, nature, and man. Um, when we look at sorry I was trying to figure out where I want to go because I want to make sure I cover some of the stuff for sure that I have in my notes but one thing that I always find is interesting and I love is when I'm studying the Bible and I find that it's quoted in several different portions and then I want to go dig in why because if it's quoted especially if you take the book of Psalms and Jesus Christ or one of the apostles or writers quoted for some reason. There's a specific reason that it was quoted, and they're bringing us some insight into that passage. When we look at the Psalm, at Psalm chapter 8, it was quoted in the New Testament several times. If someone would please find Matthew 21, 16, Matthew 21, 16, and someone else find Hebrews 2, 6 through 8, and hold Hebrews 2, 6 through 8. But Matthew 21, 16, I'll go ahead and read Psalm 8, verse 2. 8, 2 states, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Does someone have Matthew 21, and verse 16? And said unto him, Hearest thou what thee say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea. Have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? In Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, the Bible states, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made in him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast, thou hast put all things under his feet. Now, how about Hebrews chapter 2, 6 through 8? The one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou hast visited him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with the glory and honor, and to set him over the works of the hand. Thou, put, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put you know, all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under him. And we see verse 6 of chapter 8 of Psalms quoted also in 1 Corinthians 15, 27. And if someone would find he, uh, Ephesians 1, 22. Ephesians 1, 22. I'll read 1 Corinthians 15, 27 real quick. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And does someone have Ephesians 1 22? Has put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now, if we really wanted to study out 
this passage, which we will in a little bit, but we're not going to go into detail, detail, but as far as he, uh, Psalm 8, 4 through 6, all these passages, when we read chapter 2 of Hebrews, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, and chapter 1 of Ephesians, reading the entire chapter, because that gives us all the verses surrounding it, it gives us better insight into this passage itself. And David was very prophetic in his writings to begin with, as we'll see when we discuss um, Psalm 22, 23, and 24, which all discuss the three offices of Jesus Christ. I shouldn't say which all discuss, but those passages, each chapter discusses a office of Jesus Christ. But let's look at the sovereignty of God here in Psalm chapter 8. So in Psalm chapter 8, if you want to turn there, we're going to be spending the majority of our time there. Psalm chapter 8, we see the sovereignty of God. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. And if we go to the last chapter, verse of the chapter, O Lord our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. This passage deals with the glory of God. When we go down through, it discusses nature and how man was put over it and the perfection of it all. It talks about man and God's relationship with him. And not only does the chapter itself reveal to us the sovereignty of God, but if we begin diving in and studying this passage, you cannot get past the first four words of verse 1 and verse 9 without seeing this revelation unveil, uh, unveil us reveal itself before our very eyes. When we look at verse um, 8, um, chapter 8, let's go to do 9 just to save confusion. What is the second word mentioned in verse 9? What is it? Lord. Lord. But what is so special about this Lord? When we look in our King James Version of the Bible, is there anything that quit? Um, jumps out about this word Lord. It is all capital letters. What do we know about, and I, do you know what it means when the word Lord in the KJV is all caps? Huh? Yahweh, Jehovah, and what does that refer to him as? Elohim. No, that's not This one's not Elohim, I don't think. It's Jehovah. Elohim we would find back specifically in Genesis chapter 1. But every time you see all caps, Lord L, capital L, capital O, um, O, capital R, capital D. Especially, you're going to see this more common throughout the minor prophets as they begin their books. Um, thus, and the Lord, um, thus saith the Lord, or the word of the Lord came to so and so. The Lord, word Lord is all caps. What it is in the KJV is the writers were indicating to us that this is referred to him as Jehovah. And what that means is it's everything about God that you can fit into one word. Everything about him is crushed into that little word Jehovah. Anything that you need from him is not broken down into Elohim or El Shaddai. But when we look at Jehovah, it is the all encompassing word of God which is anything that you need him to be, that is exactly what he is. But when we go down just um, to, word, to the fourth letter of verse 9, what do we see as the first, fourth word of, of verse 9? Lord, but is it all caps? No. When we look at um, the word Lord here in verse 1, that is capital L, but lowercase o-r-d, and verse 9 as well, it means um, controller, or sovereign, master. So we go from seeing, O oh Lord, Jehovah, everything, self-existent, eternal, to word, to Lord who is sovereign. So within those 
four words, we see him going from everything you need to also revealing himself as a sovereign Lord of everything. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to move on a little bit. I am not going to read everything in this little passage. But, actually, we probably will look at some. But Christ in the book of Psalms, specifically Psalm chapter 8. According to Keith L. Brooks, Christ is seen in this passage because the psalm wonderful foreshadows Christ. He is the revelation of the Father's excellent name. His glory is set above the heavens. He, is sovereign. he has sovereign dominion. And it is he whom God hath clothed with glory and honor for a little time. He was made lower than the angels. He took upon himself the form of a servant. All creatures are under his feet, and he will eventually own him to be Lord of all. And we go down to um, verse 6, I believe it is. Verse 4. Well, let me back up to verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou made him to have dominion over the works of, the, of thy hand. Thou hast put all things under his feet. When we look at this passage, we might think about Adam, or us. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And we've heard it time and time again, and people can even preach, you know, what is man that God is mindful of us? Now, every detail of our life. And he was concerned with every aspect. But if we take the, this verse in detail, and we would study it out, we would find that it is actually a prophetic mention of Jesus Christ and reference to him. How do we know that? Because we've already read that in Hebrews chapter 2. Because it quotes this verse verbatim and it gives explanation to it. The author of Hebrews explained these verses, and I'm going to go ahead and go there for the sake of time. Hebrews chapter 2. And if you want to go there, you can, because we might flip back and forth a little bit. We have 10 minutes left. But Hebrews chapter 2. And verses 6 through 8. And I'm going to back. Yeah. But one in a certain place testifies, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest um, that thou visitest him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he hath put all in subjection under him. He hath nothing that is put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But in verse 9 is where we get the explanation on this passage itself. What is being discussed here in Psalm chapter 8 and verses 4 through 6? We find the revelation in verse 9 of Hebrews. But we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angel for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. And I'm going to go down to verse 11. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So when we look at this passage, what is being discussed? What, who is brought up? Who was made a little lower than the angels? What well, was Jesus Christ? What was the reason? What made him different than the, all the angels? And what was it that made him lower than the angels? For he is the one who helped create all things. It was the fact that he took upon himself mortal flesh that corruptible flesh, that one day he would have to die. From the very beginning, and I know that it was revealed throughout the Old Testament time and time again, 
But even if it wasn't for the crucifixion, the body that Jesus had would have had to die at some point because that was the design. That was the makeup. He took on mortal flesh. And because of that, he became a little lower than the angels. But at the same time, the Bible states that he was been crowned with glory and honor. How did Jesus Christ become crowned with glory and honor? What was it that crowned him? It was the fact that he did something that no other man in all of history could have done. It was something that no other man in the future, had they came after him, could have done. Because there is only one in the entire universe, universe that could have performed this action. And that is to take upon themselves the penalty of sin. It was Christ's work of salvation on the cross. Him dying and being the perfect sacrifice. The lamb slain from the foundations of the world. When he died on that cross, performing the work of salvation, it is that point, it is that moment that he was crowned with glory and honor because he did what no one else could have done. No angel, no human, only the Son of God. If we were to look at Psalm chapter 8, and verse 4 through 6, the key to understanding this passage is contained within Hebrews chapter 2. And then one last thing as we wrap up the last five minutes. We're going to look at verse 2 of Psalm chapter 8. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. What is being discussed in this passage is this. And we would not really, well, let me just back up. What is being discussed in this passage does not come to light until we study it out and we read Matthew 21 and verse 16. 21, 16. If someone would please find that. Matthew 21 and verse 16. If we look at this passage in detail and jump back a few verses, can you jump back two more verses, Mom, and just read those two as well? Yeah. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast? So Jesus is in a little bit of a situation. Not that he's never been in the situation before, because time and time again we find that the religious leaders of the time came against him. And once again, that's exactly what we see happening in Matthew chapter 21. But what does Jesus do? He goes back and quotes Psalm chapter 8 and verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sons. So if we would look at this passage in detail, what he's actually doing is silencing the scribes. He's shutting them up. And what he's referring to them and trying to bring out is time and time again, what we know in scriptures, God does not use the most educated. He doesn't always use most time the most wise men. But when we look at the fishermen, and we were taking the fishermen, were they educated? Could they have sat down and broken apart like Paul? Were they on the same education field as Paul? I mean, Paul was highly educated. But the disciples, no. But yet, at Pentecost, something special happened with them. Peter began quoting the book of Joel and rebuking those that came against him. In the early church, we find that they were teaching and they were drawing closer to God and they were building the church of God. Perhaps the majority of these men, we could classify as uneducated. They were sucklings. They were babies. They weren't ones who knew in detail what they were talking about. 
Paul could have learned at the feet of Gamaliel. He could have probably broken apart the scriptures. He would have been able to tell you what, Rabbi so-and-so. But the apostles could have never done that. They were babes and suffered. But yet it was out of their mouths that God chose to confound the wise. Going back to, and if we say, would replace confound the wise, that's the verse that we know of it from the New Testament. God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. But if we take that, go back to Psalm chapter 8 and verse 2, the last part of that means exactly the same thing. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, hast thou ordained strength because of thy enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. It's out of the babes and the sucklings, it's out of the uneducated, it's out of the unwise that God chose to work through. Why is that? Probably because the educated ones, the wise ones, they're wise in their own ways. They're wise and set in their own ways. In their own eyes, they know it all. But God looks for those who are uneducated and are willing to be used through, that he may prove himself. Because, not because God's not using to use the wise and, the, and educated, but most times they're not willing. So God goes back and uses those that are, and most times those are the unwise and the uneducated. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31, for the sake of time, we won't read it, but God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. And we can see that even in our own timeline. If we go back to creation, where did everything come from? Where did trees come from? Where did mankind come from? Where did the solar system come from? Who created it all? God. I mean, is that not the ultimate creation? Where did man come from? But if we look to the educated, the so-called wise men of our time, who do they? Where do they say man came from? Evolution, a big bang, a primordial soup from a one-celled organism that just happened to have the right elements. But what does the Bible also instruct us? Because the Bible is clear. We know that there is science, but there is true science. And then, according to 1 Timothy 6.20, science falsely so-called. True science will back the Bible every single time. But man's science because even when we get down to it, evolution, is that really science? I mean, science is supposed to be fact, right? It's supposed to be proven time and time again before I break the podium. But can we prove evolution? Can we prove the Big Bang? So, when we, and every time we talk about evolution and Big Bang, and if you see it in, in a big uh, university paper, more likely it's going to be the evolution theory, the Big Bang theory. Is a theory something that's fact? No, it's just man's hypothesis. It's his proposal. This is something that we believe happened. It's not like if somebody gets struck by lightning and there's a mark on the ground, or you know, it's definitely happened, or you picture who was there with a camcorder and caught on the film, but it's a theory. And that God uses the foolish things to be found the wise because the wise men. They know without a know a fact, without a doubt, what they know. Doesn't matter if it's been proven or not. In their mind, it's been proven. But God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And because of that, not many wise men are able to be used of God. Not many educated men are to be used of God. And because of that, out of the mouth of days of sufferings is what God uses to prove, give strength and evidence that what he says is the truth. Any thoughts, any questions, anything to add at this point in time before we close? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do, Lord. Now even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be plowed that they be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember your word throughout the week, Lord, but even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, Lord. 
anoint the pastor's lips and his minds as he brings forth your word, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you give him a special blessing as he preaches. Give the song leader and the musicians a special blessing as they uh, lead us in the songs you have us to sing. As they uh, praise you upon the vocal cords and the string instruments and the piano, Lord. I pray, Lord, that there just be a great spirit in this place, Lord, that the Holy Ghost would be able to move it however or so he desires. And that we would all find ourselves just humbled in your in your, uh, your presence, Lord, knowing, Lord, that it's not us, Lord. But, Lord, may we have a greater desire to see you like never before know you. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are, Lord, and what you've done for us, Lord. There are so many things that you've done for us that we could never dream or imagine or even try and count. Lord. But, Lord, we give you all praise and glory and honor for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. In your name, amen.